for joining us. It's very warm in the room 18. I will do our best to do it next time. I'm on a very busy day in Westminster uh, to discuss the future of NATO, the Madrid strategic concept and implications for European security, uh, hosted by the Circle Foundation. For those of you who don't know, the Circle Foundation is a non-profit, independent, non-partisan think tank based here in London, dedicated to empowering the Turkish-speaking diaspora and academic community by creating a platform for political integration and civic and democratic participation. Um, we're very fortunate to be joined by a fantastic panel of experts. My name is Thomas Copeland, uh, and I'll be guiding us through this conversation as we continue. We are joined by Dr. Osman Askin, head of the Turkish delegation, NATO Parliamentary Assembly. We're joined by the Right Honourable Bob Stewart, our parliamentary host from the um, Intelligence and Security Committee. We will soon be joined by uh, the Right Honourable Mark Pritchard, uh, Vice Chair of the Turkey All Party parliamentary group. Uh, Peter Jones, distinguished fellow with the uh, Royal Security, uh, excuse me, Royal United Services Institute, and of course, Dr. Mart Kultkev, Associate Professor of Scandinavian History and Politics at UCL. Um, thank you all very much for being with us. We will move to Bob Stewart, our parliamentary host, to offer <coughs> some opening remarks. Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Bob Stewart. I am a member of Parliament, I've been an MP for 12 years. Prior to that I was an army officer for 28 years. I served five years in NATO headquarters. I was the military assistant to the chairman of NATO's military committee for three years. So I was a speechwriter for the senior NATO officer and I was chief of policy at Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers of Europe for two years as well beyond that. So I kind of know how NATO works. The topic here today is the future of NATO. Well, let's just get it quite clear why NATO has been a success and why people want to be in NATO. And the answer is Article 5. All for one and one for all. The three musketeers. The Article 5 commitment is why NATO is so popular with democratic states. Collective security is if one person, if one country is attacked, the others go to war with whoever is attacking. So by joining NATO, you get that guarantee, and that's why people want to join NATO. As well as that, they get the guarantee of a nuclear umbrella, because three members of NATO have nuclear weapons. So that won't change in the future. That is why NATO will continue to be successful. And if Ukraine had been a member of NATO, I think it's unlikely that Putin would have attacked Ukraine. Um, so for others considering membership, <coughs> being a member actually does provide security. Now that means, particularly at the moment, Finland and Sweden, uh, but NATO membership for Finland and Sweden is not a slam dunk, is not guaranteed, although there's been an MOU about it, it has, it's not actually slam dunk, and of course Turkey has a big influence on that, it's signed an MOU, but we'll see what happens. I think in the end, um, in the end, definitely the Swedes and the Finns will join NATO. Um, so um, there are, as you know, various views on NATO in Turkey. But there we are. What we will actually get, I think, is the enlargement of NATO, particularly in the north of Europe. This Greece-Turkey problem, which has been around throughout my time in NATO from when I was a young officer and throughout my time when I was at the time at top of NATO, has been a pain in the ass. I have to tell you. I mean, the sort of the shenanigans between Greece and Turkey in the NATO Council is awful. Don't you agree? You should say that. You know, Osman, you, you would say that. Um, but uh, let's be quite clear it could be solved if the politicians were to sort it out quite easily. It's a stupid dispute between two countries who really should know better, um, and both sides are 
Now, Greece has a population of 10 million, defense budget of about $6 billion, and 106,000 in its armed forces. You compare that, Turkey has a population of 83 million, spends 21 billion on its armed forces, and there's 260,000 people in uniform. To be blunt, Turkey is a more valuable member of NATO. Let's be blunt, let's be clear. Well, it's not just because of Turkish predominance in military hardware and soldiers, sailors, and airmen, but it's particularly because of the geostrategic positioning of Turkey on the southern flank. It is also, obviously, right now, because of, you know, Turkey's stranglehold on ships going through into the Black Sea. I'll end my opening remarks by talking about China. Let's be quite clear. Tactically, we've got a problem with Ukraine and <coughs> Russia, but strategically, in the long term, the threat will be China to NATO. China has a population of 1.5 trillion, a defense budget, well, we don't know what it is, but call it 200, 200 billion dollars. And it's being extremely imperialistic in the near and far abroad, particularly in the South China Sea, by taking over islands like the Paracels and the Spratlys. And in the end, China's demand for resources will bring it into clash with other countries. And by that, I mean Siberia in Russia. Siberia's got huge resources that China would quite like to have. So it might not be too wrong for us to assume, I'm waiting for the academics here to disagree with me, that in the end, long term, Russia may well want to join NATO. It's something I considered when I was chief of policy at Supreme Headquarters of Allied Powers Europe 26 years ago. Russian defense budgets, call it 100 billion, and it has 144 million population. The Chinese, on the other hand, have got 1.4 trillion population. Just work out the balance there. Look, we are going to talk about this further. I just wanted to say a few opening remarks from my point of view as to what I thought. Now, I don't know how we're going to do this. Um, Osmond, are you going to say something? Yes. I mean, he's a football player, so <laughs> we don't know the result, frankly, ever. OK, thank you very much, Bob Stewart, for, for setting the context of why we're all here. Let's move immediately to uh, Dr. Osmond asking back. Um, give us some of your thoughts on what Bob has just, uh, just told us there. Yeah, thank you very much, <clears throat> Bob. Thank you very much. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, my name is Osman uh, I'm a member of Parliament from Rize. Uh, I'm head of Turkish delegation to NATO Parliamentary Assembly, and I serve uh, as an Minister of uh, Youth and Sport in Turkey in the 65th shift uh, cabinet. So I was in uh, Madrid summit and. Uh, as you know, Turkey is a long-standing key ally within the alliance, and uh, we fully support NATO's 2030 vision, which embraces deeper political consultation, increased defense and deterrence, and a more global approach, among other issues. Besides, Turkey has uh, legitimate security concerns that should be addressed particularly related to counter-terrorism efforts. In that uh, Madrid summit, uh, our uh, uh, President Mr. Erdogan has taken the floor uh, in the NAC meeting, mentioning about terrorism and its affiliates within the allies. So that's an important issue for Turkey. When our delegation, uh, also these issues were recently raised up uh, due to the Finland and Sweden's uh, applications for the membership in the alliance. Of course, we, we, we were not saying that uh, the terrorism issue only for Sweden and Finland. 
because Turkey is also, since I am in the AP Parliament, the ASMB, also in all meetings, we were talking about terrorism, terrorist activities, and PKK and its affiliates uh, within our borders and within Turkey, and also any terrorist attacks within allies. Terrorism is a key issue to discuss within the allies. We have been attacked by the terrorists and the terrorists in London, in Brussels, in Paris, everywhere. So that's the prime issue for, uh, for, uh, for allies. That, that, that's what we raised in, in our uh, meetings. So when our delegation sat down at the table, we only reiterated two case reservations. The outcome of the discussion depended on the other side of the bedroom. So we listed our expectations once again, and when these were included in the text, we signed the memorandum of understanding. In the end, all of our expectations were put into the text. This signed memorandum is important for Turkey. First of all, for the first time, the PKK affiliates, PYD, YPG, and uh, also known uh, in Turkey as a federal terror organization, uh, are in the text and also in the NATO documents. Although this was a tripartite party agreement facilitated by the uh, Secretary General, it was welcomed in the Madrid summit declaration and become a reference document. Regarding the fourth article of the memorandum, Finland and Sweden, as allies, should give full support in response to the threats to Turkey's national security. Sweden and Finland have committed to full cooperation with Turkey in the fight against the PKK and its affiliates. The text of the memorandum also includes commitments to remove embargo and restrictions in the defense industry and to increase cooperation. The two countries made a commitment to fight terrorism and update their defense industrial legislations. On the other hand, the permanent joint mechanisms to be established will not be limited to the to three countries, but will also be open to the participation of NATO countries. So terrorism, and uh, let again that terrorism is the most uh, issue most important issue within the uh, allies. So we faced with this, and we lost 40,000 people, civilians and soldiers in, in this uh, terrorist issue. So that, this is an uh, important issue for, uh, for Can our... Can I re-emphasize that 40,000 people killed? Yeah. Yes. That is a very important point. We in the West, the rest of the West, because Turkey's still in the West, we don't quite get that. We should understand how many people have died. Yeah, I mean, within the uh, scope of the agreement signed with the two countries, in addition to sharing intelligence on the fight against terrorism and taking concrete step, steps towards the extradition of terrorists, it was agreed that if there are deficiencies in the bilateral agreements with those countries, also in judiciary and extradition process, those will be eliminated. So, all information regarding the uh, persons whose extradictions has been requested from Sweden and Finland has been conveyed to these countries. This process is, this memorandum of understanding is the beginning. So the next step is also important. As you know, the, the process of uh, accession to NATO has started, but not completed. So, these two countries will not be able to become members of NATO without the approval of member states' parliaments. So parliament is also playing a very important role in this issue. And as also, uh, Turkey is also playing a very crucial role when we come to, this is one part. You know, everybody was uh, very supportive uh, in talking about this background in the other summit. Of course, uh, as Mr. Merdan mentioned, I, I kept my promise, but the others also should keep their promise. So this is 
the population. And also Turkey, Turkey is uh, uh, playing a very crucial role within the context, context of uh, Russia and Ukraine war, which is, as you follow up now today, uh, UN, United Nations, uh, Russia delegation, and also Turkish delegation, and also Ukrainian delegation are meeting in Istanbul concerning the grain corridor issue. So since the conflict started, the 24th of February, Turkey has played a crucial role. And Turkey is the only country that can speak both, uh, both countries, Ukraine and also Russia. So this is uh, important points uh, Turkey plays within the allies. So, uh, as you know, uh, we should stop this, we should all work to stop this war because this is affecting all all world in terms of energy issues and also very uh, affecting Europe energy issues and also grain issues to concern North Africa, other countries all, all around the world. So the, approximately 20 million uh, tons of uh, grains stay there in the Ukrainian ports and Russian ports and also fertilizer. Fertilizer is another issue. So Mr. Erdogan spoke uh, on phone yesterday uh, with Mr. President Zelensky and also Mr. Putin uh, concerning the, those issues. Also, Turkey uh, has bought uh, bought uh, Ukrainian uh, foreign minister and uh, Russian foreign minister in Antalya to start its uh, peace talk and we continue in Istanbul and we, we, Turkey is a uh, moderate can talk water, we can solve this. And also Turkey is, uh, within, when the war started, Turkey responded uh, this Russian aggression. But we saw, uh, I will not point out this on an important issue, Mr. Erdogan also mentioned that uh, when the uh, annexation of Crimea by Russia was the important point, and the rest and the world did not respond strongly. That started there. And also, go back to 2008, Georgia issue is also an issue. So, we, we, we support Ukraine's uh, independence and territorial integrity, and also we, we mentioned all those issues uh, within those. And also, uh, Turkey recognizes the violent conflict between the two countries as a war, as Smith declared that it will uphold the provisions of the Montreal's Montreux Convention, which displaced Turkey's strong commitment to its duties and obligations under the international law. So we, we, as Turkey, we are playing crucial, as uh, Mr. my friend Mr. Bob Sir mentioned, Turkey is uh, because of the geopolitical, geopolitical position is, is, is a very important position. And other issue, refugee uh, issues, which, which is so hard for us. And Turkey has five, more than 5 million refugees from coming from Syria, and that war is, uh, started in 2011. It's uh, been ongoing. So this, we are sharing and carrying a big burden on us. So also, Turkey is in the southern flank is, is so important. Turkey is a, a, can, can imagine as a dam to stop all those refugees flow. Otherwise, we will face many issues. So that's and also Turkey, Turkey is balancing uh, uh, Russia in, uh, in different places, Syria, Libya, and also uh, in Azerbaijan, in other uh, issues. So that's what it is. And also, the last point I would like to make, and in Ukraine, and uh, our support to, uh, and our good relations and, uh, with Ukraine in terms of uh, the defense industry and other issues, we have supplied them uh, Turkish drones. As you know, Turkish drones has played a very crucial role in this Russia-Ukraine war. So TV2s are were, uh, very effective and they, uh, they have killed Russian tank convoys and stopped them to 
move to the big cities. So that's uh, they played as a game changer in that respect. So Turkey is still uh, uh, taking its role in, uh, within the NATO allies and, and committed to uh, work with the NATO. So that's uh, just the points I would like to make at that moment. So let's stop here. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Back, for that. <coughs> Let's open up this conversation a little bit more. Um, uh, we're joined by uh, Mark Pritchard, the Vice Chair of the uh, Old Party Parliamentary Group on Turkey, who I will be explaining shortly. So, uh, I'll let you offer your reflections on what you just heard from Dr. Back there, and then we'll expand about this conversation even further. Okay, well, thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you, uh, Bob, uh, my good friend, Bob Stewart, uh, who's introduced himself so, so well, who not only is long list of uh, well-deserved titles, but uh, his, his, his excellent insights and comments. And Osman and I have known each other for many years. I, I was on previously the Council of Europe and then NATO Parliamentary Assembly as well. Did you ever play football? <laughs> I, I played one match for Hereford United Reserves and was so good that they never invited me back. <laughs> so there we are. Uh, Osman's uh, a really good football player. Oh, is he? Yeah, good. Okay. Nice legs. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, and of course, Peter, who was um, a former, I think, from memory, uh, Director of Security, uh, International Security, FCDO, uh, and many other roles besides. So good to see you again uh, as well. And thank you uh, for uh, the Circle Foundation for organizing this very timely um, discussion. Turkey is absolutely critical. And uh, Theresa May, when she was Prime Minister, her first visit, I believe, was to Turkey. Uh, and there was good reason for that. Uh, we have somebody who's now head of one of our intelligence agencies, who's public, who's our former uh, ambassador uh, to uh, Turkey. And uh, yes, uh, watch football. Well, he's doing a good job. He should be good friends of everyone. Uh, so, uh, and he's a fantastic guy. And, you know, Turkey is a key uh, strategic partner, not only bilaterally for the UK, but also clearly for our uh, relationships uh, in, in, in NATO and beyond. I, I was elected last week as Vice President of the OSCE, uh, and I'm very grateful for the uh, support of my uh, friends from the Turkish delegation, your former Interior Minister and uh, Security Director for Istanbul. Yeah. Um, and so, of course, we're talking about Ukraine. Uh, that's the immediate, if you like, main foreign policy uh, issue for all of us. Uh, but I think it, it's reflective of, of a wider shaking of the international order, uh, global uh, security order. And there are those that would seek to undermine the NATO security ar architecture and that of the OSCE, uh, and would seek to uh, use Ukraine as a platform for wider destabilization uh, around the world, not least uh, in North Africa uh, and in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, using grain as a, as a weapon of war. Uh, and of course, you know, what does, what does that issue of grain mean? It means that uh, Ukraine does not have the income that it should have. I think that the, its GDP is contracted by 75%. Uh, and that, uh, of course, it also means that whilst the war as a hot war is going on, it's very difficult to currently uh, harvest what's currently in the ground. So you have a double whammy of storage, grain being in storage, unable to export it, unable to actually get uh, other uh, foods out of the ground. Um, and then, of course, with the hot war going on, you can't then sow seeds, other uh, product, uh, food. Uh, for uh, next year and beyond. So that is in fact a triple worry. Uh, and then you have um, Putin uh, allegedly, with lawfare, I would say allegedly, with lawfare in this uh, city, um, uh, stealing uh, Ukraine's uh, grain and using it to uh, uh, prop up his uh, numerous palaces and the criminal gangs that surround uh, him in the uh, Kremlin and side uh, and also use it for his own geopolitical ends to manipulate um, leaders that might be manipulated uh, by uh, the promises of Ukraine, Ukraine of grain when others can't uh, access uh, that grain. Uh, Putin of course doesn't care about anybody else apart from himself. Um, he doesn't care about 
about uh, women being butchered, children being uh, butchered, and by the way, children being raped, uh, and women being raped, and men being raped, and people being uh, brutalized all over uh, Ukraine. Uh, he doesn't care about anything else. And that certainly means he doesn't care about uh, those that are further away than Ukraine. So my, my personal view, and I speak as a member of the governing party, but not on behalf of the government, just my personal analysis, um, I suspect that, um, Putin is very, very uh, relaxed and might even have this part of his strategy to uh, see governments collapse in, in North Africa. Uh, fragile democracies who are in the Commonwealth or not in the Commonwealth uh, collapse. The more chaos, the better, as far as Putin is concerned, he thinks. Um, what does that mean for Turkey? Uh, and as I myself have been remarked, Turkey is key. Uh, and whilst um, uh, I would describe the Turkish Russia relationship as a sort of um, schizophrenic one, on off to the hot cold, uh, the fact is that Turkey is going to be on the front line of a lot of these migration issues. So it's in Turkey's national security interest and its national economic interest to do more uh, to try and resolve this uh, crisis uh, with Ukraine. Even if the Turkish people, the wonderful, generous, kind-hearted Turkish people who have done so much for so many refugees, even if the people of Malta were not overly concerned about what's going on in Ukraine, I would say that they need to be because it's going to indirectly, at some point very soon, have a massive direct impact uh, on the fine country of Turkey. On the Black Sea, again, I speak personally, you mentioned the Montreux uh, Convention Agreement. I'm, I've said this before, but personally speaking, I'm very relaxed uh, about a NATO member being in the ascendancy uh, in the Black Sea region, if I compare the alternative of uh, Russia. And of course, there are other countries, important countries on the Black Sea, Romania, and Bulgaria, and Georgia, uh, and others. And um, I, I, uh, I think that um, this is an opportunity strategically. I mean, the Turks are the best, some of the best diplomats in the world. You've got the Persians, the Iranians, you've got the Turks, you've got the Brits, and I could probably say the French, who've been doing diplomacy for a long, long time. And I would hope uh, in Ankara and Istanbul, it would be seen as a strategic opportunity for once for Turkey to take full advantage and to knock Russia off its place of dominance in the Black Sea. Now how that's worked out with other partners, who are also our partners, uh, around the Black Sea, it is something open for uh, discussion. But as I say, this is an opportunity uh, for Turkey uh, to ascend and uh, actually uh, perhaps settle, certainly in the short and medium term, uh, who is the dominant, basically who's top dog in, in the Black Sea. Uh, so Turkey needs to do more because of the immediate need of grain and the migration, and perhaps see a uh, strategic opportunity within the uh, chaos. Um, I've mentioned refugees. I just want to mention, sorry, to the point about um, uh, Finland and, and, and Sweden. Clearly, that's a democratic choice for their uh, countries. You're quite right, there will need to be parliamentary ratification, and that hopefully will happen quite soon in this uh, parliament. And others. And let's not forget, this is not, and there is this false narrative of um, NATO having poked the bear in the eye, having poked. This application by Finland and Sweden has come directly as a result of Putin's fa uh, mass miscalculation and failure. So it is the aggression of the bear rather than a provocation that has brought uh, Finland uh, and Sweden uh, into orbit of, of NATO very uh, soon at all uh, membership. So let's let's sort of kill off that, that false uh, narrative. Um, some figures that are figures of people that have been killed and mentioned earlier. And we've heard Georgia 2008, we did not respond robustly enough. Crimea 2014, we did not respond and when you look at the conflict uh, in uh, the Donbass, over that period of time, 
16,000 people who were killed. I mean, that is a significant number of people who were killed. And yet, NATO, EU, the West, uh, we turned the other way and we're now all paying the consequences. I'll just conclude on this, if I may. Ukraine is not NATO's border and it's not the EU's border, <coughs> but it is freedom's border. And that sounds like a sort of trite lip statement. But Putin will have to be defeated. And it's better that he's defeated in Ukraine. It's better for the Ukrainians that he's defeated in Ukraine, because by definition, if he's not, he would have taken over Ukraine or most of it. And then he will continue to wreak its havoc elsewhere. So the pain and suffering is going to be more widespread, more severe, unless more supporters and allies of Ukraine, NATO, EU, and others supply more weaponry, more modern weaponry, more quickly to give the Ukrainians uh, to uh, finish them and allow them to finish the job. They need to win there. If we don't, it sends a signal to other people, and indeed Putin, to do more elsewhere. And I think we are moving into a very, very uneasy geopolitical phase in our sort of narrative, and this certainly in the last hundred years. We've had many wars. I think we're going to potentially see a lot more conflict in a lot more areas spread out around the world. And that's why we need a strong, clear, unequivocal stand on international values and the rule of law and those things. And they aren't Western constructs. Freedom of, uh, uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion, uh, human rights, rule of law and democracy. We have to stand together. Turkey is a major player in that. And thank you. Mark, thank you very much for those thoughts. Let's bring in another perspective, Dr. Mark Kulkat. You've heard a sort of British perspective, a Turkish perspective. What about your expert in Scandinavian and Baltic history? Give us a perspective from that part of the world as to the significance of what you've heard so far. Thank you. And many thanks for inviting me here. Uh, I, of course, agree with a lot of what has already been said. And while I could respond to a lot of those points, I would, you know, in the interest of time, uh, constrain myself and only talk about Finland and Sweden. And I think there are three main things that need to be said about Finland and Sweden in this context. Firstly, why NATO and why now, which has also been you know, touched upon already, but I think a bit more could be said. Then secondly, what's the relationship between Finland and Sweden themselves? And what's the difference between Finland and Sweden when it comes to NATO and security policy more generally? And then finally, what about Turkey and those concerns that have been uh, mentioned? And what about the negotiations and the memorandum that, that uh, has come out of those uh, negotiations? So, firstly, um, it's very easy to think of Finland and Sweden's uh, NATO application as a direct response to uh, Russia's actions in Ukraine starting on the 24th of February. And this is true, but there is a, there is a history between uh, the Scandinavian countries and NATO that goes further back than that. That goes indeed back to the Cold War period and the so-called neutrality policy that both of those countries had, had adopted in the aftermath of the Second World War for very different reasons. Uh, in case of the case of Finland, it was, I think it's fair to say, forced into neutrality because of the memorandum uh, of friendship uh, or treaty of memorandum, uh, of memorandum of friendship and uh, cooperation it had with the Soviet Union. And then Sweden sort of picking neutrality because it had worked for Sweden both in the Second World War and also in the First World War and further back, back to the Napoleonic Wars, uh, indeed. And neutrality during the Cold War was for them a foreign policy that made sense uh, in one way uh, or another, particularly uh, for uh, Finland that really didn't have any other realistic option because of its security ties you know, to the Soviet Union, but also for Sweden that had long since thought of itself as kind of a country in between who could fulfill a useful role of mediation and peace building and so on, uh, being outside of alliances and be, be more secure outside of alliance, alliances rather than uh, as a member uh, of one. And when the Cold War ended, uh, of course, the strategic situation changed for both of those countries. For Sweden in particular, there was nothing left to be neutral about after the demise of the Soviet Union. Why would it you know, pretend to not to be able to pick between capitalism and communism if one of those was no longer a viable option? But also for Finland, why it did you know, 
uh, in, in, in some ways, give up its neutrality policy, as did Sweden when they joined the EU. They never went the full way, they never uh, submitted an NATO membership application, because this was a time of desecuritization. Uh, it didn't really feel like there was an urgent need to do so. You could say NATO itself was maybe changing in this period, it was turning from a Western partisan alliance into much more of a broader forum for security issues. So influential circles in both Sweden and Finland were European security is being discussed. But they were unable to sell this point strongly enough to the electorates. They weren't able to sort of do away with this um, uh, sense of um, sus uh, suspicion that people had developed towards NATO during the time when both Sweden and Finland were assuring everyone that they were genuinely neutral, even though it was a fiction in many ways. Uh, Sweden uh, definitely had a secret, co secret cooperation uh, going on with NATO throughout the Cold War period. So, at the same time, though, they weren't as close as they could. Both of them joined the Partnership for Peace program, both of them joined the Enhanced Opportunities Partnership. They weren't as close to NATO as was possible without being, becoming outright NATO member states. And uh, this means that when UK again in, uh, was again invaded by Russia uh, in uh, late February uh, this year, they were kind of ready. They had done the debating, they had done the thinking, what would NATO membership be paid for them, and uh, what kind of uh, you know, uh, difficulties it would pose uh, potentially. Now, getting to my second point, the difference between Finland and Sweden. Finland was the country that acted as the leader uh, on this issue. It was Finnish leadership that uh, made it inevitable for, uh, for Sweden to, uh, to submit the membership application as well. And this is very unusual in the dynamics between Finland and Sweden. Throughout its their modern history, Sweden has always been the leading country. Finland has always emulated. This was the case, for example, with EU membership applications back in the 90s. It was Sweden who moved first and then Finland followed. But there is a kind of uh, partnership between those two that makes it very difficult for one country to take a fundamental step in their security policy without the other one following along. Um, this is something I don't have time to go, go into, but it's almost inconceivable that, let's say, Finland would join NATO and Sweden wouldn't, uh, or the other way around. So Finland, in some ways, made it inevitable for uh, Sweden uh, to join. At the same time, though, Finland has always retained its uh, sort of strong territorial defense, and it has always seen Russia as its main geopolitical enemy. This has not been the case in Sweden. In, in Sweden, back in 2004, they decided that there was no credible territorial threat to Sweden at all to that. And this led to some very embarrassing uh, incidents that I won't go into. But uh, Sweden very much pivoted towards the sort of troubleshoot security and, and the expeditionary forces that we have in fact. But Finland is already there and is exercising leadership on that issue as well. So Sweden is definitely going through a, a, a more important change than, uh, than Finland is uh, uh, joining NATO now. Now getting to this uh, issue uh, on Turkey and the two Scandinavian countries. Um, what exactly happened, uh, we don't know, uh, at least uh, I don't know for, uh, for sure, because a lot of those issues really should have been raised and really should have been talked about before uh, Finland and NATO went public uh, with, uh, with the declarations uh, decided, whatever they announced that they decided uh, to uh, join. Now, other people here might have more insight uh, into this, so maybe they can take an insight. But anyway, it all happened with an unexpected speed. Uh, it uh, all went very quickly, and so I don't think it's you know uh, uh, unnatural that there might be uh, cracks uh, in the way. But anyway, uh, there have been negotiations, and there is this memorandum that was uh, signed uh, on the eve uh, of the uh, recent, uh, summit in uh, Madrid. And uh, from the Swedish and Finnish uh, point of view, this was uh, certainly a big step forward. And it was certainly a win that they managed to score. It is a political document, it's not a legal document. This is not the final word uh, on this year. There have to be ratifications, as has already been said. And the Finnish president, Sauli Minister, also said with his characteristic Finnish, uh, you know, uh, uh, Finnish uh, country silliness, uh, this is just one step uh, forward. So it remains to be seen uh, what's going to happen and how much of the language in the document is actually going to lead to some uh, real policy changes in uh, Finland and Sweden. 
But I think people in Scandinavia are very hopeful, and I also think, like more generally, uh, all NATO allies, both the ones that are already there and the ones that want to join, they share fundamental security interests. And cooperation will not fail to happen in the end, I think, when the political will is there to overcome the uh, differences and to acquire those, uh, those guarantees that the different countries are looking for. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cook. And let's bring in another perspective, specifically around, I think we'd be interested to know, uh, Peter Jones, what's the impact on NATO going to be of some of the developments that you've been hearing about from, from, from our analysis? Sure, well, <coughs> so um, a few comments on yeah. that and on what's been said and on the side, but I'll try and keep it brief. Yes, I want to do the discussion. And first of all, I, I think this trilateral agreement, the memorandum between Finland and Sweden, and Turkey is quite a remarkable one. I mean, it was necessary to see Finland and Sweden to get that approval to it. I mean, but if you look at it, um, you know, the, the commitments that have been made by both Finland and Sweden are very specific, and if I may say, I think it's a triumph of Turkish diplomacy amongst, amongst other things, and an agreement that helps everybody. And what's also really <coughs> interesting is the pace with which this process is continuing. So it allowed that agreement, allowed the agreement in principle at the Madrid summit. Then we had the accession protocol signed the next week. I think by the following weekend, we had nine ratification processes completed in the UK, the Netherlands, I think yesterday. So this is a time scale. The alliance has never operated before bringing these members. So that Bob talked about three musketeers or 30 musketeers, let's say, in NATO. We will have 32 musketeers, I think, before too, too many months. And that is, um, uh, you know, strengthening in NATO in the north. We can talk in the deep, if you like, about what exactly Finland and Sweden bring to the alliance. But it, you know, it's a strategic shift for the alliance as well as for Finland and Sweden. Set it against the context of the strategic concept that was agreed at the Madrid summit. I mean, that's, I think, a remarkably impressive document. It's quite brief, it's only about a dozen pages. It's absolutely crystal clear about the threats, first and foremost, Russia and the threats in the European environment, but also takes a broader view. And, and it's interesting that we talk about the importance of terrorism from a Turkish perspective, not only Turkish, British, and other countries as well. I think very importantly in the strategic concept, it doesn't choose. It says all of these threats matter state-based threats, the threats to the rule-based border, it talks about China, I don't know if that has been picked up in, in Beijing, but it also says that terrorism matters a lot, and I think that's the right approach to the alliance, to say that we have this immediate, very wide concern to do with Moscow's actions and the war going on on our doorstep in Ukraine, but to remember that those threats are of course still there as well. And alongside that statement of the problem, some measures to respond, so in addition to welcoming to the allies shortly, a, a, a complete sort of reworking of NATO's defense and deterrence posture, uh, in particular with the reinforcement uh, of the uh, eight battle groups of the Eastern Allies, you know, new more rapid reinforcement capability, and so on. Uh, and so all of that, I think, is really, really impressive. But, as with any NATO summit, the summit of the concept is the start, it's an important start. Then you have to implement, you have to bring in our new allies, you have to make sure the new force postures happen. Uh, and then you need to be responding to events because however good these agreements and however welcome the prospect of Finland and Sweden coming in, let's not forget we have a big problem going on right now. So how the alliance adapts in response to that war and how it helps Ukraine is really, really important. Okay, thank you very much. Let's try to get as many questions in as we can. We've got about 10 minutes left, and I know that folks are getting very warm. So we'll want to move to more air conditioned space as soon as possible. If there are questions, let's get some hands in the air and see if we can move through them. We're all being a little bit shy, but I'll give you some time. Okay, yes, sir, go ahead. What do you um, start us off? I'm going to be a bit provocative to start off with. Um, okay. Is NATO, I know this is an argument, is NATO too much dependent on the US, given all the political risk and one country exposure that the US represents globally? Do we, do we have enough? Embedded, I heard from Liam Fox yesterday about we should be um, um, no party should be too important, no individual should be no import, so important. Do we have the systems in place today to guarantee that the US, given that we depend so much on them, no matter what political party is there, no matter what individuals come and go, that this will stay? Okay, let's keep it brief, Jess, but let's go full circle. Bob, do you want to respond to that? Or does anyone yeah, of course, it's too, too dependent on the United States to provide something like 70 to 80% of its assets. Indeed. And that's why it's crucial. That's why we've got to keep you know, the United States in. Remember, Lord Ismay, when they founded NATO, was something like, uh, keep the Americans in, the Russians out, 
and the Germans down. Those are the three reasons for NATO. That's what he said. So the answer to your question is, are we too dependent on the United States? Yes, and thank God they're still providing that dependency, because the Europeans would do sod all about it, because they won't be prepared to pay for it. Americans pay too much to NATO, and the Europeans pay too little, including my country. Peter, why don't you respond to that as well then, sir? Well, it's, it's a great and fundamental question about us here at NATO. So, you know, this is a you know, North American European partnership, and Bobby will write about the predominance of the United States, and that continues. So, the, the new force construct you know, is partly about American reinforcements being able to come in quickly when needed. But, two things I would say NATO is becoming more European, and the accession of Finland and Sweden actually accelerates that process. So, that's going to be an interesting dynamic shift, I think, between. We have the defence spending commitments of right to refer to the, you know, the, the effort put in the, <coughs> the Wales summit here in 2014 where all the Allies you know, uh, committed or reaffirmed their commitment to 2% of the national income minimum on defence. That's reaff and progress has been made on that. Uh, that's reaffirmed again in the new strategic concept. So European defence spending has been going up, covered by the government of and I think that will, that will continue. Germany in this context is very, very important in probably the whole set of conversations about where Germany is going. Very final thing, uh, it's always worth reminding our American friends that thus far, Article 5, Security Guarantee in NATO, has been invoked only once, and that was when America was attacked on 9 11, and something happened about it with the Europeans rallying to take action in Afghanistan. And I think it, you know, you know, it's worth just repeating that because I think people forget it and think it's a long way street. Okay, let's get more questions in the air. Sir, did you want to respond in particular? Okay, no, let's get more, more questions today. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can sort of red t shirt. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, I, my question is in general from the beginning of the talk. Um, uh, well, sir, you mentioned about the retaliation, or the, the, the fact that if Ukraine was part of uh, NATO, then potentially Russia would not have attacked. I, I want to push on the credibility of the potential retaliation on Finland that Russia, has, or Putin especially, has been talking about. How credible are those threats, and what could NATO potentially do on those potential threats? Well, I mean, one thing that Finland and uh, Sweden immediately get is the nuclear umbrella above, above their countries. And they also, they're not, they're not impotent themselves. They're quite, they've got quite good armed forces. And you've got to remember 1939-40 war, um, where the Finns gave the Russians a really good beasting. Um, so, I mean, we are actually getting valuable allies coming into the, in, into the alliance with Finland and Sweden. Uh, coming, coming aboard, and then uh, you know, my son-in-law has just been to Sweden, um, flying a, a um, what's it called, not a Jaguar, the Typhoon, in competition with Griffin, their fighter aircraft. The Swedes went away limping a bit because they've got to actually improve their game on on their fast jets, They're because the, the Typhoons actually took them apart. So. It will help the Swedes, it will help the Finns, and my goodness, it will help our alliance. Mark, a competitive yeah. answer from Bob, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I completely agree. I would just maybe add that Putin has gone on the record uh, saying, oh, well, we don't actually care that much anyway, and they are, of course, free to do whatever they <laughs> wish. And another thing which I think is important, Russia has withdrawn military units stationed right across the border from Finland in recent weeks. And, you know, this is prime evidence that they don't actually see NATO as a threat, and they don't see Finnish membership, membership in NATO as a threat, and those threats are not very well Okay, uh, let's get a few more questions in if we can. I know that Ines wants to finish this off some of remarks. Yes, go ahead, sir. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. And my question is, what do you think is the turning point that NATO pivoted from Russia to China? And is it wise to have two enemies at the same time? Okay, Dr. Patrick, you want to start in response to that? Well, I mean, it's far away from us, so we are expert in the Middle East. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, once we had a, a meeting in, uh, in Chicago, uh, it's, it's not easy to take uh, Russia and China at the same time. So that's uh, that's important uh, and difficult question to answer. But uh, NATO is becoming more stronger, more uh, and also, as we know, 
in the Pacific that are uh, near uh, developers concerning uh, AUKUS, Australia, Japan, and South Korea, and the United States are having this kind of uh, Pacific thing uh, issue. They are co cooperating within that. So, of course, we will talk uh, these threats in the, in the future, but we have first, we have, as far as I said, uh, you have seen us containing Russia first. First, you have to contain Russia, then you have to go to the Pacific. So, as far as we understand, in the Pacific, uh, there's a big difference between the United States and China in terms of uh, missiles and submarines, etc. So, there are time to, uh, to move there. So, that's Peter, do you have any thoughts on that question? Well, I'm just to say that I think if you look at the strategic concept and the documents out of the NATO summit, there, there is a difference in how Russia and China are described. I mean, Russia is very clearly, I would say, rightly identified as the big threat right now to security in Europe and the euro area. It's a statement of the obvious. China is referenced in a different way, and it's, it's to do with the rules based international order and how important that is to us. So, um, you know, it, 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 it's a it's, it's a difference in approach, but it's saying you know we care about those values and the rules-based uh, international environment as well. Um, so you know it, it's um, uh, it's not a, it's not one single thing. I think there, there is a disaggregation between the two. Okay. Any more questions? I care what you personally as possible. If not, I'll throw it on to to Mark Speaker as well. A lot of discussion not that long ago where I'm from in Belfast was about Ireland's policy of neutrality. Is this beginning of a number of other countries considering changing their stance on issues like neutrality? Mark, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, I mean, how, how many do we have left? It's uh, Switzerland, Austria, Ireland, and uh, none of them are threatened by Russia in uh, any intermediate way. So I don't think this is necessarily going to become a very salient issue right now. I mean, their strategic geopolitical situation is just uh, too uh, different than the political conditions. I don't think countries can be considering it at the moment. That's my, my view at the moment. Okay, interesting. Uh, Peter, your thoughts? Yeah, I, mean, uh, I think that's right. I mean, I, for, for other countries, I think, although the open door is there for people to, to join the alliance, I think what we'll see is much more in the way of developing partnerships with, with other countries. Ireland is a really interesting uh, example. Obviously, there's a very long, painful, and complicated history with the United Kingdom. But what was very interesting, I think, how it seemed to me Irish sentiment in the Republic seemed to be absolutely revolted by what the Russians had done. And the Russians were very cavalier in their references to, to Ireland and some of their activities off the coast of the Republic of Ireland, you know. So maybe there was a sort of, you know, a bit, a bit more of a perception in the Republic and whatever their issues with the United Kingdom was something there that you know, the whole of Ireland needs to be worried about. Okay, fantastic. We're running out of time and I promised I would leave it as a for some closing remarks. If I'm slightly cheeky, I wonder if we get 30 seconds from our parliamentary host, Paul, on your final closing thoughts. The, the tipping point for NATO will be how great is Chinese imperialism. The way China is actually expanding militarily, politically, socially, and economically becomes a worry. Um, it's already expanding hugely in, into the South China Sea, it's threatening Taiwan, it's trying to get bases into India, even the Mediterranean, and even the Arctic. It's claiming the Arctic is somewhere, some, some sort of preserve of China, too. God knows how, but it is. It's the imperialism of China, the, the, how hard and how fast that goes that will bring it into conflict with Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, the Philippines, even Vietnam. And it's, if China pushes down on the accelerator, that tipping point where the West, Western military alliance starts getting pissed off will become much quicker. And we'll get a new NATO in the Far East, which we will, of course, be linked to. Okay, End I'm, of story. I'm 30 seconds from Dr. Yeah, yeah so I, I just, mm -hmm. I just uh, reiterated two issues concerning uh, grain issues, corridor, uh, which he has also mentioned, is, is starvation is coming up in, in, in Africa and North Africa, so that will cause and, uh, more refugees issues in the face and the fertilizer. And uh, the Africa, in Africa, Senegal, the, the president of the Senegal, Nikki said, said that if we don't get fertilizer in, within uh, their 
one and a half months, we will face big starvation in, in Africa. So that's the important issue to solve. So it's going to be a hot topic, uh, food security, energy security in the coming, the coming years. Thank you, Dr. Bach. I've left him absolutely no time in which to speak, but as president of the Circle Foundation, any closing remarks and thoughts? Um, I just would like to thank all our panel speakers, uh, and special thanks to Bob Stewart for hosting us today, and uh, to our uh, guest of Turkish guest from Turkey, although he came all the way from here, all the way from Turkey from here, and to our members, actually, uh, in this hot summer uh, day, they all made uh, their way to come here. I just would like to make a few announcements. Uh, as a Circle Foundation, um, we are working on a very special report on post Brexit uh, Anglo Turkish relations, which will be published in September, where we will be uh, making the launch for this report in the Conservative Party Conference. And we, we are also uh, organizing fringe events, two, two fringe events in the Labour Party Conference and three uh, in Conservative Party Conference. And uh, we will be continuing to organize uh, events on security, foreign, foreign affairs, and uh, trade between Turkey and the UK. And, uh, and that's all. And thank you very much for Tom for uh, sharing the event. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Bob well, has to absolutely run. He's been away somewhere else. So thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. Go and find somewhere air conditioned on a, on a large. <laughs>